Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Beth in my closet in North Carolina. And this is Christy in my closet in St. Louis. Here we are. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Worst time of year. <laughs> Serial killer September. Mm. That's like a superhero. Everyone's ready. <laughs> it's not good music. Not good. They're definitely not No, they're heroes, awful. That's for sure. We're so glad that this month is here because then it will be not here after that. <laughs> yes. And it'll be a whole year before we have to do it again. Yes. If we do it again. Don't we say if we do it we again. Do. <laughs> we went all out this time, though. So we've got four serial killers coming at you starting today on this Labor Day, this day of labor when it comes to research. And <laughs> so we hope you guys mm -hmm. are relaxing by your on your porch or your pool and not having to work, spending time with your family and listening to insane serial killer number one. We've got survivor stories over on the Patreon. The first one dropped on Friday, so it's really good. Go check that out if you're so inclined. Yes. It's been a good palate cleanser. It's not, actually. It's a terrible story. <laughs> it just happens to... Yeah, they're still... They're not great stories, but it's like, yes, the person survived. Yeah. So, you know, it's good. And they are definitely amazing survivors. So there's that. That's what's going on. And it's Labor Day. Yeah. Long weekend. Yeah. Long weekend. And we have not, I have nothing, nothing That's going nice. On. So, it, well, baseball game, but like, uh, Cardinals baseball game. Oh, kid, yeah, fun. Like, carting people around kind of thing. So, but anyway, so yeah, so it'd be nice and relaxing. Yes. Or it was. Nice We're hosting <laughs> a little get together, but that's fine. It's fun to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And everyone's bringing sides and. We're just going to throw stuff on the grill. Yeah. Make it easy when everyone helps out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a couple anyway, of we... people to thank. Mm -hmm. We have a new yes, we do. Patreon, Miss Kimberly S. over on our Patreon. She is our closet sister just in time. I told y'all, this is the month. If you're going to mm -hmm. try it, take the $3 and get it this month. And then we also yes. have a supporter on Anchor, which is our... Very yeah. first one of those, which is awesome. So thank you, Shayna. Yes, Shayna. Thank you so much. We appreciate yeah. it. We do have a Patreon if you want to switch over to that. We get more content. That's true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we do appreciate you supporting us either it's way. Awesome. <laughs> if you need help, send us a message and we'll direct you to the right place there. Or you can just stay right where you are because we love you. Yeah, you're yeah. fine. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine where you are. All right. Do you have any news? Not really. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I think that's good. I was trying to, yeah, because we've got you've quite quite an episode coming up, so it's probably good that we just keep it this quite short and sweet. Episode, actually, all of, all them, of are. them are. This was a good one to kick it off mm -hmm. on. Let's just get started. Let's get into it. All right, okay. here we go. Are you ready to get in to this? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am Very sorry to tell face. you no. that you are going to have to deal. I have my drink today. I hear it. It's quite a hefty one. <laughs> it is. And because I feel like I need to numb it, numb the pain. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, this is um, quite a ride. So you are definitely going to have to hold on to your pants. This serial killer was a suggestion from one of my favorite people in the world, my good friend Ashley. Oh, right, right. Yes. So um, without further ado, I will bring you the man with possibly one of the stupidest names I've ever heard. I'm so like waiting just to hear this name. Edward Wayne Edwards. Oh, I know that name. You I know that. do? I do know him. Mm -hmm. I am shook. I had because never of his heard name. Him. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he preferred to go by Wayne, like mm -hmm. later in his life, but everyone called him Ed. So I'm calling him Ed because okay. your preferences don't matter to me, sir. Well, I, name, I mean, it is in both of his, two of the three of his. <laughs> so you the must dumbest be. name ever. Like, 
And you and it gets even dumber. What mm-hmm. like the fact that this is his name, and I'll tell you in a little bit. Um, okay, so Ed confessed to killing three people, but has been convicted of killing five. Sorry, I just thought of it. Really, it's like ew. Is really his name E W E W E. It is it's like really that. you, but <laughs> maybe you. that's what I should call him. Okay. Okay. So he confessed to killing three. He's known to have killed five, but is suspected of possibly dozens more. Jeez. He lived a very long life of crime, but he is dead. So that's good. Because you know I like to do the dead ones. <laughs> so they don't come Hallelujah. Me. All right. Let's get into it. Edward Wayne Edwards was born on June 14th of 1933 in Akron, Ohio. This makes him a Gemini, which is the twins, dual personalities in one person. Twin names. Twin names. (laughs) It's so dumb. I can't either. Get over it. Okay. Ed was actually born under the name Charles Murray. Oh. Why did he change it? That seems like a much cooler name. I know. Yes, I will tell you why. (laughs) Okay. So he was born to a single mother named Lillian Myers. Lillian, and he never knew his father. Okay. Lillian worked as a house cleaner. And when Ed was one, his mom stole $100 from a woman that she was cleaning for. So that's over $2,000 now because this was in 1934. Mm. And she was sent to a women's reformatory for 17 months. During the time that she was in the reformatory, her sister, Mary Ethel Edwards, and her husband, Fred, took care of Ed. When Fred and Ethel? Fred and Mary Ethel. I know, but... <laughs> Mary, Sorry. I mean, don't forget Mary and Mary Ethel. Okay, I know. Okay, it's a vibe. <laughs> okay, so Mary Ethel and Fred Edwards took care of him, and when Ed's mom was released, she was, again, in no position to take care of him. And then in 1937, she shot herself. Oh. And passed away. So Ed's aunt and uncle, Mary Ethel and Fred, adopted him. And they changed his name to Edward Wayne Edwards. I mean, right? Come on. I know. And I, Mary Ethel, from all accounts, was a great person and very loving. So I don't want to speak ill of her, but like, Mary Ethel. For, like, seriously, I get, okay, let's change his last name because we're, we've got him now, whatever. But you could have kept Charles, Charles Edwards. Mm-hmm. Right. Or you could have even kept Murray, Charles Murray Edwards. <laughs> if you wanted him to have three names, as serial right. killers do. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Anyway. So, like I said, Mary Ethel was a wonderful and loving mother figure. However, shortly after Ed was adopted, she was diagnosed with a terminal illness. Mm. And could no longer take care of Ed. Fred, the adoptive father, was a heavy drinker and he couldn't take care of him either. So in 1939, when Ed was seven, he was sent to live in an orphanage in Ohio. Oh, man. Yes. So at the orphanage, Ed started getting in a lot of trouble. So he was a bedwetter. And this caused him to be picked on. And the nuns who worked there were abusive to him. I mean, I guess to all of them, Mm -hmm. not to mention he had just lost his biological mother and his adoptive parents. So he began acting out. It is reported that when one of the nuns asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up, he said to her, quote, sister, I'm going to be a crook and I'm going to be a good one. (laughs) Well, so this is as a young child. He is like, I would like to be a criminal, ma'am. Okay. Self-proclamation here. That's right. Ed eventually got kicked out of the orphanage because of his behavior, which I didn't even know they could do that. But I was just going to ask, how do you get kicked out of an orphanage? You are there because you have nowhere else to live. So right. how? <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Well, he was sent to live with his grandmother, which I guess was his mom's mom because he didn't know his dad. But they didn't think about doing this before they put him in the orphanage to begin with? I mean, uh, maybe sh- I don't know the details. Okay. Of, like, yeah, I know. She I couldn't know. take him at that point and then was forced to or whatever. But while he was living with her, his rebellion continued to escalate. He started stealing. He started getting into fights. And one of his favorite things to do was to pull fire alarms. 
Oh, that's fun. Yeah. He later told people that he liked to pull the fire alarm and then stick around and watch all of like the panic and chaos. So oh. he liked that he was the cause of all of that confusion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. In 1948, when he was 15, his behavior landed him in a reform school in Pennsylvania. A couple years later, when he was 17, he was released from the reform school in order to enlist in the United States Marines. So he joined the military. He, Which, yeah, it's like, here's your chance, Ed. Right. Make something good of yourself. Exactly. He was stationed at Camp Lejeune, which is in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. It's in Jacksonville. However, he then learned that because he was only 17, that he was too young to be sent into combat. So in 1950, he went AWOL from the Marines. Okay. And do you know what AWOL means? I looked it up. Like, I mean, actual... I know you know what it means, but like, do you know what it stands right. for? The, I, I feel like when you say it, I'm like, yes, I knew that, but I can't. It's not coming to me. Absent without official leave. Okay. Yes, I looked I it did. up. Yeah. Fun fact. So he went AWOL from the Marines and he went on the run. And while he was on the run, he was committing burglaries and thefts so he's like escalating he would rob gas stations he would steal cars he robbed a couple banks hmm. so we're so starting he was mad that he couldn't go to combat so he wanted to be involved in like some heavy stuff i i think that is true mm-hmm. but i mm-hmm. we don't know right okay i mean there's also a possibility that he was like i'm useless here and so I'm not okay, going to do this. This is not what I signed up to do. I want to go full out and mm-hmm. and fight for my country and couldn't. There's that possibility, but I doubt it because he is a right. POS. Mm-hmm. Okay. So he was finally found in Jacksonville, Florida, and was arrested and dishonorably discharged from the Marine Corps. In 1952, at 19 years old, Ed was arrested again. This time for impersonating a Marine and interstate transportation of a stolen car. Mm. He was sentenced to a reformatory in Ohio for two years. He was released from there and arrested again for burglary. Then in 1955, he broke out of jail. Well, look at that. Broke out (laughs) and went on the run again continuing to commit robberies and burglaries in multiple states. Hmm. He was caught a year later in Montana and was sent to prison there. He was released after three years, but was immediately taken to Portland, Oregon, to stand trial for two armed robberies that he had committed while he was on the run before his Montana arrest. Oh, wow. We're doing great here. We're doing Mm -hmm. great. Yeah. So he's in jail again in Portland. And broke out of jail again. Lord have mercy. And went on the run, committing burglaries and robberies. Also during this time that he was on the run, this time he married a woman named Marlene. And so she went on the run with him. Oh. <laughs> so we're <laughs> he like. didn't settle anywhere. No. Like, just, let's go. But Bonnie and Clyde vibes happening over here. So they would rob people. Rob stores, rob gas stations. Sometimes they were armed when they did it. They would pose as various law enforcement officers. Ed later said that he never tried to disguise himself or his identity when he was committing these crimes because he wanted to be known for them. Mm. Like he wanted to be a famous criminal. That was like mm-hmm. his goal. Goals. Good. Good goals. Hashtag goals. So in November of 1961, still out on the run, having broken out of the second jail, when he was 29, Ed was added to the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Oh, wow. So he was like a high profile criminal here. He was thrilled. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I, I can imagine. I mean, he's broken out of jail two times, so I'd imagine that helped get him onto that list. Yeah. Dude's a runner. Mm -hmm. So a federal warrant charged him with unlawful interstate flight to avoid confinement after a robbery conviction. Two months later, in January of 1962, 
Ed and his wife, Marlene, were found and captured in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, they're looking for her because she's like aiding and abetting him? Well, she was also committing these crimes. Oh, she was like in on it. She just wasn't with him. Okay. Yeah, no, she was, they were doing it together. Okay. I don't know what happened to her. I didn't look it up. I'm sure she went to jail also. But Ed was sentenced to 16 years in a federal prison. And this time he was sent to Leavenworth. Okay. So they were High like, security. yes, no, you're not getting out. You're going to Kansas. Mm-hmm. Five years later, he was transferred to a federal prison in Pennsylvania. I don't know why. And then was given parole based on good behavior. Okay, people. I know. He was 34 years old. Okay. So he reported at this time that the five years he was given had transformed his life. He was transformed and reformed now. Mm-hmm. You know, he's going to, he's this life he's leading of crime. He's done enough. He's met his goal of being on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. So he's going to straighten his act up now. I don't think I believe him. Now, during, I know, right? Yeah, right. The end. <laughs> <laughs> Good serial killer story. Yes. <laughs> okay. During his time in prison, his marriage to Marlene had dissolved. Mm. But after he was released, Edward, Wayne Edwards, <laughs> got married again to a woman named Kay. And they went on to have five children. Wow. So he's okay. a family man now. Yeah, he is. He wrote an autobiography about his life of crime and how he had turned it all around called The Metamorphosis of a Criminal, True Life Story of Ed Edwards. Yeah, I've he heard about He wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. And you know what happened? He got famous. Uh-huh. This was a big book. It gained a lot of notoriety. He went on book tours. He did speaking engagements. He became a motivational speaker, my dude. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. This was in the oh 70s. Gosh. He would speak in schools and churches and universities. He was on radio shows. He even appeared on a couple game shows mm-hmm. back in the 70s where celebrities would come on and they would say, Okay, we have this person who is a criminal and he broke out of jail two times and robbed banks and stole cars and was on the 10 most wanted list of the FBI. Guess which one it is. And so they had to guess which of the three contestants was actually that person. (laughs) Fun game. Yeah. (laughs) Like, man. (laughs) Also, did they get to ask him questions like the dating game? Yes. Okay. Yes. Like they would be like, so. Contestant number three, tell me about your first time in prison. And then they would tell. And they so like some of them were lying. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Okay. So this is Ed. He's famous. He's a famous reformed Mm -hmm. criminal book author, motivational speaker, game show contestant. I mean, if only he had left it at this. Like he could have gone down as, you know. Famous for this. Right. This is a much better reason to be famous. I'm reformed. I'm now a motivational speaker. (laughs) I'm I'm doing well. Edwards. Yes. Okay. So Ed and his family moved around quite a lot. Remember, he's got these five kids. He's got this wife. He would do the book thing, and then he would work odd jobs as like a handyman, a vacuum salesman, you know, whatever, but never for very long. They would move like every six months something like that. Mm -hmm. So everywhere they went, he would befriend law enforcement and he kind of became an informant for them. So he like, without them asking (laughs) to, but he Mm -hmm. would like hang out in bars and would find out about like gang activity or drug related crimes. And then he would tell the police about it. He would be like, okay, there's a hit happening, blah, 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 whatever. So Again, they wouldn't stay any place for very long. He would sometimes pack them up very short notice. Like he sometimes would come Mm -hmm. home from work one day and be like, pack up, we're leaving. Right. We're going to Florida or whatever. Sometimes it was the middle of the night. Like they would just take off. And he would always tell his family that the reason that they were having to leave is because bad people were after them because he like Mm -hmm. narked on them. So he would say like, oh, this drug dealer knows that I told police about blah, 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 and he's gotten in trouble and he's sending guys after me. So we got to go. 
Sometimes the places they would live, he would use false names, sometimes not, but he would always befriend local law enforcement. No matter where Mm -hmm. he was, he was always like law enforcement adjacent. Keep him close. Keep him close. That's right. (laughs) Keep him in your pocket. In 1982, when Ed was 49, the family's house in Pennsylvania burnt down. Ed told law enforcement that he believed it was burnt down by people that were after him for snitching. Mm -hmm. This is why I run. But then Ed's three sons said, actually, we helped our dad set the house on fire because we needed insurance money. Oh, So Ed was like, yes, that's true. That's what happened. I did need the insurance money because we need to go on the run. And we set the house on fire. Mm -hmm. So Ed was convicted of arson and served four years in a Pennsylvania prison. So he had gone a period of time, no brushes with the law legally, but he did go to prison for four years for arson. Okay, He was released in 1986. After that, the family continued their normal pattern of moving and Ed working various jobs. It's reported that they lived in over a dozen states in a 20-year period. So they moved a lot. Wow. They lived in Ohio, Florida, Arizona, Colorado, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Georgia. They moved more than we did. I (laughs) I so thought that same thing when I was writing this paragraph. I'm like, you were like... Maybe they are into some illegal yeah. things. They keep moving around. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but you don't have three names. So that you makes don't. me feel a little I don't better. even have a middle name. So <laughs> that, that's weird, though. So never mind. on the other end, that's weird of the spectrum. It's fine. We don't need to talk about that. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's a rabbit hole. We don't need to go down today. Okay. Okay. All right. So while living in Ohio in the 90s, Ed took in a young boy by the name of Danny Law Glockner. So Danny was a foster kid that went to school with Ed's children, and Ed felt sympathy for him because he had grown up in a similar way. He didn't have parents or a family. And so he took this kid in and called him Danny Boy. Mm -hmm. The Edwards never legally adopted Danny because he was already 18. But Danny did legally change his name to Danny Boy Edwards just because he wanted to be a part of the Edwards family. So he, D- Danny Boy. Uh huh. Like Boy was his middle name. Okay. Yes, we're doing okay. great. Tracks, tracks well. Yes. <laughs> so after high school, Danny Boy joined the Army. But after being in the Army for a short time in 1996, he went AWOL and disappeared. Oh. Sounds familiar, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Mm -hmm. The Edwards family searched for him. They worried about him. They tried to find him. He, from all accounts, was an awesome kid. He was, like, really grateful to be a part of this family, never caused any trouble. But he just disappeared and never came home. Mm -hmm. Then the following year, Danny Boy's body was found behind a cemetery by some hunters not far from the Edwards home. And he had been shot in the head with a shotgun. He was only 24. Oh, gosh. So the whole family was devastated, especially Ed, because Danny Boy was like his, like, he was saving him, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And no one ever knew what happened to him. No one knew who had killed him or why or what had happened. So as the Edwards children became adults... Because now they're getting older, they're in their 20s, they began to wonder about things that had happened in their childhood that had been odd or strange or like Mm -hmm. even bad, specifically about their dad, Ed. They remember they had normal birthdays, they had normal holidays and vacations, but they could never really understand why they moved so much every few months and the circumstances surrounding the moves quickly out of nowhere in the middle of the night sometimes they wouldn't even take their stuff they would just leave Mm -hmm. and they all got the feeling that they definitely were running but started questioning what they actually were running from so ed's children their children but they're adults at this point recalled that their dad had a very hot temper and that he had a dark side and was very secretive So they remember weird things like they would be out at stores with their dad and he would just steal stuff 
Like he would just take something off of the shelf and put it in his pocket and walk out with it, like blatantly Hmm. in front of them. He was very verbally and physically abusive to their mother, Kay. Mm -hmm. And they all remember a time when Ed stabbed Kay with a kitchen knife because she had eaten a bag of chips that he wanted. So like, oh my gosh. So as children, you're like, oh my gosh, dad is really mad about that chip bag. But as an adult, you look back and you think like, huh, maybe he's capable of some really bad things because that's an example of it. It's a bag of chips. <laughs> I'm sorry, but even as children, I'd be like, not, oh, dad's really mad. Like, what the hell dad well, stabbed yeah. mom <laughs> <laughs> yeah. over chips? <laughs> Definitely something you would go to school and tell your teacher, I feel like. But yes, I right. feel like my kids, well, at this point, my kids would call the cops. But yeah. That's like t- right. in today's. They, as they world, should. But, yeah. So they all recall being abused at some level by their father, but Kay got it really bad. They also remembered that there would be people around their family, friends of their family, people that worked with their dad, that all of a sudden, for one reason or another, would just be gone. Mm. Like, they were around, and then all of a sudden, Ed would be like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to be friends with them anymore. They're not going to work with me anymore, or whatever, and never really, you know, Mm. could put their finger on what was going on. And they all thought that Danny Boy's death was very suspicious. They remembered that their dad was really obsessed with any crime or murder that was going on locally in the news or in the newspaper, and he was specifically obsessed with the Zodiac Killer, Oh, who was on his crime spree during all of this time. They actually remember that if there was news on about the Zodiac Killer, he would make the entire family watch it. Like, he would be like, force them to watch the stuff about these murders. Hmm. Ed's oldest daughter, April, became convinced that her dad was a violent criminal all their lives and that it explained so much about his behavior and the way they grew up and how they would move all the time. And she would randomly Google cold cases in cities where she knew they had lived. Like if she could Mm -hmm. remember the name of the city, she would Google, like, is there any cold cases in Ocala, Florida or whatever? But she never found anything. Okay. Okay. So there's Ed. There's the backstory. In 2007, 2007, the state Mm -hmm. of Wisconsin cold case unit received a grant to revisit five cold cases. So they said, here's money. Pick five cold cases. Reopen them. Use this money to solve them. One of those cold cases was a double homicide from 1980 called the Sweetheart Murders. Mm Mm-hmm. On August 9th of 1980 in Jefferson, Wisconsin. It's my anniversary. I mean, not 1980, but. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> I wasn't even born. <laughs> August 9th. I okay. was. <laughs> well, that's interesting because this is about a wedding that happened on August 9th. So mm, these people what do you know? had the same anniversary. Okay. Mm-hmm. So August 9th, 1980, Jefferson, Wisconsin, a couple, Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, went to a wedding at a local venue called the Concord House. So Tim and Kelly were both 19 years old and they had stopped by this wedding of a friend of theirs to wish them congratulations, but they were only staying for a few minutes because they had other plans. They were going somewhere else that evening in town. So Tim Hack, he was um, from the area. He worked on the family farm. He was like a tractor puller. I guess that's a thing. And he owned a contract combine service that he ran. Mm. And Kelly, his girlfriend, was a hairstylist at a local salon. So they went to this wedding. They were seen at the reception, but then they were never seen again. And they never came home. The following day, Tim's dad found his car parked at the Concord house with the wallet and his keys and cigarettes still inside. They were nowhere to be found, the couple. Hmm. So investigators went through the guest list of anyone at the Concord house that night, all the family's friends, family members. No one knew where they were. They were wondering, did they run away? Where are they? They're just missing. Six days later, Kelly's clothing was found three miles from the Concord house scattered along the road. Like someone had just been driving and threw her clothes out the window. 
The clothing was all cut up. So it looked like it had been cut off of her. And also around her clothing, there were pieces of rope, which they felt like were related Mm -hmm. to her disappearance. So now they're definitely suspecting foul play. They didn't want to like her clothing is cut up and on the side of the road. So searches were done of the surrounding area around the Concord house, around the place where her clothes were found, horseback, dogs, helicopters, all that. Nothing was found. Then two months later in October, seven miles from the Concord house, squirrel hunters found the remains of a female body. Mm. 70 yards away from the female body, male remains were found. Are you sure it wasn't mushroom pickers? It wasn't. It was squirrel hunters this time. Okay. It's a new one. Yeah, that is. Don't hunt things. No. Don't be a hunter or a picker. <laughs> or a serial I mean, killer. <laughs> well, yeah. Let, let's start with that one first. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm serious. We should train hunters on what to do if they come across something like this. Because it happens mm. so often, I feel like. Well, I mean, I'm sure they they immediately call most of the time, so. I hope so. They did this time, I think. Yeah. Okay, so we found these two bodies. They were badly decomposed, but they were identified as Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. Mm. Kelly was completely nude, and she had ligature marks on her wrists and ankles. Her cause of death was possible strangulation, but they couldn't oh. be sure because... She was just so badly decomposed. Tim was fully clothed and his clothing had evidence of stab wounds. So it Mm. like they could tell in his clothing that the clothes had been stabbed. So they speculated that his probable cause was stabbing. Mm -hmm. There was rope found near the bodies and the knots in the rope were consistent with military knots. Mm. Again, everyone was re-interviewed. Everyone that was at the Concord House, that worked at the Concord House, friends, family. They never found any suspects. No motive was ever found. They were buried together, Mm. which is so sweet. The murders were then named the Sweetheart Murders, and their case went cold. Gosh, okay. Until... 2007, when the Wisconsin Cold Case Unit received that grant and their case was reopened. Woohoo! Kelly's underwear and other clothing were sent for DNA testing and semen was found on her underwear and her pants. It's amazing to me that stuff is preserved that well. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness it was in this particular case. I think that doesn't happen all the time. Right. Okay. But there were no matches in the system as to whose DNA it was. Mm. In 2009, this information was made public. So the Wisconsin police said, we reopened this cold case. We have DNA. We don't know whose DNA it is. If you guys have any tips, please call and let us know. April, Ed's oldest daughter, happened to read an article about the Sweetheart murders and how they were trying to solve this case 29 years later. And something stuck out to her. She recalled that back in 1980, when the murders took place, her family was living in a town nearby Jefferson, Wisconsin. And at that time, her father was a handyman at a local wedding venue called (gasps) the Concord House. Oh, man. She remembered this murder occurring and that her dad followed it very closely. Mm -hmm. She also recalled that while they were living there, her dad had come home randomly one night with a broken nose and his face was cut up. He had told the family that he had been in the barn shooting pigeons and the shotgun he was using had kicked back and hit him in the face. But April remembers thinking, no, he wasn't. We would know if he was shooting pigeons in our barn. Also, why Mm -hmm. would you do that? has to be a better way, but anyway. I was making a face when you said it, so. (laughs) She also recalled that Ed had been questioned by the police and that he told the police that same story and that shortly after he was questioned, they packed up and moved out of Wisconsin. Yeah, they did. So April called Wisconsin Cold Case Unit and told them that she believed her dad was involved in the murders of Tim and Kelly. Mm. So, of course, the Wisconsin Cold Case Unit is like, what? (laughs) 
okay, we'll, we'll verify. Police went through their files and they saw where Ed had been interviewed because he worked at the Concord House at the time of the murders. Their files also showed that when he was interviewed, he had a broken nose and a black eye. So mm. that part of April's story checked out. Police contacted Edward's landlord at the time and confirmed that the day after he was interviewed, he had abruptly left town and moved to Pennsylvania. Huh. So that part of April's story checks out. Police then decide, we're going to learn more about this guy. And they read the autobiography that he had written back in the 70s. When they read this autobiography, they found a psychological criminal profile. Ed had a history of mental illness, an interest in fire at a young age, petty crimes that escalated, prior abuse to women. He was a bedwetter. He had a strange obsession with small brunette women, which Kelly Drew was. And mm. he immediately became a suspect in the sweetheart murders that had occurred almost 30 years before. Wow. So police hunted Ed down. At this time, which was 2009, he was 75 years old and living in Louisville, Kentucky with his oh, wife, man. Kay. So he was still married to the same lady. Mm -hmm. Ed was in very poor health. He had severe diabetes. He was in a wheelchair. He was very overweight. He was on oxygen. They go and interview Ed and he denied ever knowing Tim and Kelly, didn't remember their murders. And they were like, well, how about you just give us our, your DNA? You know, you worked at the Concord House. It'll clear you. We can leave you alone. Let you age in peace. And he said, oh, I don't really think I want to do that. And then they were like, well, we have a warrant, so you have to. <laughs> oh, man. So they took a sample of his DNA. And a couple weeks later, when it came back, guess what? Is a match? It was a match for the semen that was found on Kelly Drew's underwear 29 years later. Wow. Edward Wayne Edward was arrested and charged with Tim and Kelly's murder and was extradited back to Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Ed told investigators that he had consensual sex with Kelly Drew back in 1980, and that's why his DNA was found, but that he did not kill them. Yeah, I'm sure. But yeah, okay. right, Ed. Now, they also knew that he had lived this crazy life of crime and then allegedly was reformed, but then randomly killed two people. And they're thinking back to all the things the children have said about him, the lifestyle, how they moved around a lot. And they know that there is no way he this was the only murder he committed. Ed told police that he knew he was going to die in prison and he didn't want to be there very long. So he really just wanted the death penalty. But Wisconsin didn't have the death penalty. So they were like, why don't you just c confess? Mm -hmm. Like, come clean. Tell us. Tell us really what you've done. So Ed decided to write a letter to the police department in Ohio. He said he had something to tell them and that once he did, they'd want to give him the needle. So investigators from Ohio traveled to Wisconsin to interview Ed, and he confessed to another double homicide from 1977 in Doylestown, Ohio. Mm. So in August of 1977, a car belonging to 18-year-old Judy Strobe had been found in the parking lot of Silver Creek Metro Park, just a park, a local park. Mm -hmm. Her purse and shoes were found inside, but she was nowhere. Police discovered that Judy and her boyfriend of eight months, 21-year-old Billy Lavaco, were missing. A search was done by family members and the local police. The National Guard was called in and in some nearby weeds and tall grass. So like in the park nearby the car, their bodies were found. Mm. They had both been shot at point blank range with a 20 gauge shotgun and their case, which was now 32 years old, was cold. Oh, wow. So Ed says that his family was living in Doylestown, Ohio at that time and that Billy would do handyman work with Ed and was like a friend of the family. So he would come around, come to dinners. Ed told police that Billy was having an inappropriate physical relationship with his daughter 
and that he found out about it and said he was out at a bar one night, saw the two of them drinking, Billy and his girlfriend Judy, got angry, and when they left, he followed them and then followed them to the Lover's Lane Park, pulled them out of the car, and shot them both. Oh, my gosh. His account was 100% confirmed, and he had details that were not available to the public. So Mm -hmm. Ed was charged with their murders as well. Now, Ohio does have the death penalty. However, they did not have it back in 1977. Oh, so at the time of the – it has to be in effect at the time that the murder was committed? Yeah. So when he committed these murders, the death penalty was not in place. And he did probably police, didn't know that. He didn't. They he failed was, to mention was, that. Yeah, he was trying to get the needle. <laughs> Correct. Right. And they just didn't tell him. You know, mm-hmm. they were just like, oh, keep talking, keep talking. So he kind of was tricked into confessing to Billy and Judy's murders, but still. So in June of 2010, Ed pled guilty to the murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew in Wisconsin and Billy Lavaco and Judy Strobe in Ohio, and he received four life sentences for their murders. But he was still in Wisconsin at the time. He was very upset. He was like, please send me back to Ohio. Please give me the death penalty. Blah, blah, blah. Now, by this time, the Wisconsin investigators had been looking into Ed's past very heavily. They were digging up information from all the areas that he had lived, places where he had been known to travel, when he was on the run, when he was with his family. They found dozens of possible murders and other robberies and crimes that could be linked to Ed. But one that stuck out to all of them that they really wanted to solve was the murder of Danny Boy in Ohio Mm -hmm. in 1996. So they started pressing Ed about it and asking him. And he sang like a canary. Oh, my gosh. Ed told investigators that Danny Boy had an ankle injury and was about to be medically discharged from the Army, which disappointed him. He said that he convinced Danny Boy to go AWOL, so it would appear that he had run away or just disappeared himself. He then took him on a walk into a field nearby their home and told Danny Boy that he had someone coming to to take him to like a place where he could hide out for a while. He asked Danny for a cigarette, and when Danny Boy bent down to get one out of his duffel bag, he shot him in the face and in the back with a shotgun. Oh, my gosh. His, like, son, essentially. Yeah, no kidding. He then left his body in a shallow grave, went back to his car, changed clothes, and drove away like nothing happened. And pretended like he was worried about him and searching for him. He then proceeded to collect the $250,000 in life insurance that he had taken out on Danny Boy when he enlisted in the Army. P.O.S. Oh, my gosh. That's awful, right? I mean, they're all awful, but like, okay. So Ed was charged with the murder of Danny Boy and extradited back to Ohio. He pled guilty, and in March of 2011, he was sentenced to death by lethal injection by the state of Ohio. His execution was scheduled for August of 2011. However, on April 7, 2011, Edward Wayne Edwards died of natural causes at the Corrections Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio, at 77 years old. Well, good. I am glad that he died naturally because I feel like they gave him what he wanted, which I, I just would have been like life in prison. I agree. Sorry. I agree with Sorry. that. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. I would have made him live out. Which he did live out his natural life in prison, but like, right, right, he still got what he wanted, and that just is gross. No one claimed his body after his death. No one. Huh. And he was cremated, and his remains were placed in the state of Ohio Asylum for the Insane Cemetery. <laughs> I know. I kind of am here for that Sorry. a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> also, that is so weird to have an asylum for the insane cemetery. Like, yeah, it is. It just sounds very creepy i'm sure that's on like a haunted show or something yeah probably okay the investigators that worked on some of the cases with ed were obsessed with this guy they were convinced that he murdered many more people throughout his life ed kind of alluded to it as well but he never gave up any information like they would say stuff like we know you killed more people we know you are a crazy homicidal maniac and he'd be like yeah 
but he never would tell. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. So he was connected to a double homicide in Portland that he was actually questioned on when it happened. This is the murders of Beverly Allen and Larry Payton. They were 19. They were both killed near a vehicle in like a park, Lover's Lane situation. Beverly was found raped and strangled. No evidence ever connected Ed to the murder, but he was in Portland at that time. And so again, was I, questioned. So, um, But aside from Danny Boy, clearly, is his MO like Lover's Lane kind of people? Yes. Yeah? And I, mm. we're going to talk about that. Okay. Yes. I even say, I hope you picked up on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I just proved it. <laughs> what I'm throwing down. Okay. Right. There's also double um, murders in Montana, several in California that all could be connected to him because he was there at the time and they were unsolved. Okay. So to the connection. Aside from Danny Boy, all of the murders were young couples that all seemed to be on a date in their car, at a lover's lane situation, which sounds a whole lot like. Oh my gosh, what's uh, the Zodiac Killer? Yes. Yeah. Oh, the one he was obsessed with. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And as we know, those are all unsolved. No one knows who the Zodiac Killer is. And we oh, do. Isn't there a theory that he is? That's exactly a theory. He is definitely okay. mm-hmm. on the list of possible potential suspects because he would be similar age he traveled around those murders are unsolved the victims are all the same when was the last zodiac killer killing i don't know a one that they linked to him i think it was in the 90s but i don't know okay which would which would track yeah that's when danny boy was murdered right Mm -hmm. yeah he was murdering in the 90s 60s 70s 80s 90s all the time he was on this book tour Living his life, being a family man, on I TV mean, shows. Oh, and the daughter also says that she can remember like when they would watch stuff about the Zodiac Killer, that her dad would yell at the TV and be like, nope, that's not how it happened. So she believes to this day that her dad is the Zodiac Killer. His daughter <laughs> thinks this. And she's not alone. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm kind of on the train. I don't know. <laughs> Wouldn't it be crazy if I just solved it? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I didn't solve it. I'm just telling what I know. Okay. One of the investigators in Wisconsin that worked on Ed's case, remember I told you they all kind of became obsessed with him and um, the fact that he killed a bunch of people. He wrote a book called It's Me, Edward Wayne Edwards, The Serial Killer You Never Heard Of. Okay. In this book, he goes way off the deep end, in my opinion, and claims that Ed was responsible for literally every famous unsolved or controversial murders that you can think of. Like, Mm -hmm. literally all of them. The Black Dahlia, Lacey Peterson, John JonBenet Ramsey, Jimmy Hoffa, the Zodiac Killings is in there. He even says, now get this, that he believes that Ed killed Teresa Hallback. Remember, Stephen, we reported on that case. uh uh Stephen Avery was convicted of her murder. This guy is saying that Ed framed Stephen Avery for her murder. Which, like... Has he framed anybody else for anything else? I I don't think he's... I don't think he killed Teresa. I mean, he was living in a nearby area in Wisconsin. But, like, it's it's a stretch for me. I didn't read this book because I just... It just was a little bit too far-fetched. And most of the investigators and Ed's family were very annoyed at this guy Mm -hmm. for making all of these crazy claims and allegations. But the Zodiac Killer, I'm not, I'm, Mm -hmm. I think that's a possibility. That's not far-fetched to me. It's not. It's, it's in the realm. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that his name is in the hat. Right. I, I agree with, I think it should be. Mm -hmm. So, five known murders, Billy Lavaca, Judy Strobe, Tim Hack, Kelly Drew, and Danny Boy Edwards. All young people, rest in peace. It's awful. Possibly dozens more. And that is the story of Edward Wayne Edwards. I, I mean, wow. So, I 100% knew the story. 
Because I watched a show on him. Really? Did you watch a show? I watched several shows. I'm curious to know. Hold on. Let me look at the camera. I can't remember. I remember sitting with Emery watching it. And we were both like, what in the world? Because it was the daughter, April, that yes. was like bringing light to everything. Okay. And so you watched People Magazine investigates Probably, yeah. My mm-hmm. Father, the Serial Killer. That's what it's yep. called. And it is mm-hmm. April, the oldest daughter, who was the one that tipped off the Wisconsin police. Yeah. And they have like footage of the, did he like live in a trailer or something? And when they found him, I don't remember, but I don't they have foot. Whatever I watched, there was like footage of them. Interviewing him. Knocking on his door yes. and interviewing him. Correct. And, and doing, also and, yeah. his interrogation is in there too. Yeah. Yeah. Where he confesses. Right. And he says in his confession, I mean, I'm not sorry. Right. I don't feel bad about these murders. If I felt bad about them, I wouldn't have done them, huh? Like douche bag. He is an yeah. awful person. <laughs> like he awful. is. And you can watch the game show footage. That's on uh-huh. there too. And like, yeah. he's a totally normal looking man. Nice. I know. I looked. At, I like Googled him again because I was like, I can't remember what he looks like. And I mean, he was. I mean, when he in his younger years, yes, he was a, a nice looking man. Mm-hmm. They walk among us. They say that he is. He is crazy. I. I'm so glad that you actually covered him. That's how yeah. did Ashley find him? Do you know? She watched that um, People's Investigates uh, and was like, "Have you heard of this guy?" She's like, yeah. you should do an episode on him for Serial Killer September because it's a ride. I mean, like, yeah. the guy was famous for being a reformed criminal and all the time was a serial killer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And might yeah. be During the that Zodiac. Like, right. Oh my gosh. It's bananas. He might be, like, the sickest <laughs> to me, <laughs> like, a serial killer. Like, the fact that he – I mean, like, they're all sick. But the fact that he – could actually be famous and out in the public saying that he's reformed yes, while in the living. background doing because he's probably doing those murders like you said to, like on the on the book tour and whatever anyway gosh that's so crazy crazy edward ed <laughs> wayne edwards wayne. oh and something interesting just from a psychological point i was thinking about this i was telling wes about this so his whole life, he goes by Ed Edwards, right? And then all of a sudden, later in life, he starts going by Wayne. And I wonder if that's when he stopped murdering people. And that oh. was like a, a psychological way of him being like, I'm done now. I'm going to be Wayne. Do you know when that happened? I don't. Like specifically? I know it was later in his life, like like after the 90s, at some point when he was aging. I wonder, uh, these, ser- oh, sorry, serial killers that have gotten away with it, like, was it Gary Ridgway? Is not the guy, the um, Golden State? Isn't that? Yeah. No. No, he's no, not he the Golden not, State. Not Golden State. Um, gosh. Anyway, but the Golden State guy who's like old and whatever gray mm-hmm. when he gets caught years later because of DNA profiling, whatever. Um, D'Angelo, Joseph D'Angelo is the Golden yeah. State Killer. So guys like him, like Ed Wayne Edwards, and and Golden State guy, like, at what point do they make that decision that mm-hmm. okay, I need to stop doing what I'm doing? Because everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people, like they're they're still doing it when they're caught, right? These random ones that just decide, okay, I'm done, and then go on living their lives and get caught, you know, in their 70s and 80s. Just before they die, mm-hmm. like, what what changes? I mean, we right they they age out of it. They're too old. Yeah, they just they like, just age out can't of handle crime. it. Right. Mm. Interesting. I mean, that's, we know that's that that fascinating. happens. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, but that's just fascinating to me. Like to to because clearly it's an addiction to be doing that. I mean, you have a draw for it, and so just decide one day, okay. I can't do it anymore. Yeah. So I'm going to stop. Going to be Wayne now. Yep. Here and to call me Wayne. One of the investigators, when they interview him, and this is on the show, he is trying to butter him up to get him to confess to these murders. And he says, hey, I have a copy of your autobiography. Would you mind signing it for me? <laughs> and Ed says, I will, but I'm going to sign it Wayne. Hmm. So he didn't even sign it. 
Edward Wayne Edwards. He just signed it Wayne Edwards. So like he really made a point to be Wayne. And I just right. feel like that means something. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I agree. No one talks about that, though. That's just my opinion. Mm-hmm. Right. Wow. Well, again, that was a wild ride. He is an interesting person. It is fantastic that his daughter stuck with it. Like something in her was telling her and she would like Google. I remember that. Like she's like, she was just looking for the one thing that was going to confirm what she was suspecting. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, we lived there. Let's see if there's a crime there. Oh, we live there. Let's see if there's a crime there. That was fascinating to me when I watched that show. I remember. So anyway, thanks again. Thanks for bringing it to us. (laughs) And thanks Ashley for telling Beth about it. Yes, my girl. Case number one. Down. <laughs> um, do you know, I don't know if we actually have mentioned this on any of the other intros because, you know, whatever. But does I wonder if everyone realizes they're getting four this year. Mm, I think <laughs> we have said the, that. We have because the past we've done like two or two episodes, one like on background, one on the murders, and then we do a live and like discuss it. Yeah, we've done that. But this year, we're doing one every week. And they are long. (sighs) We will be so glad when they are done. Yes. I'm also glad that Edward Wayne Edwards is dead. I know. That is so funny. I totally forgot about that with you, but I do know, like... (laughs) I'm scared of them. (laughs) I want them to be dead so they don't come after us. (laughs) I mean, half the other murderers that we talk about aren't necessarily dead, so... (laughs) I know. There's just something about serial killers, like... Like you said, they don't stop. Like, yeah. other murderers are awful, but they murder their intended victim and then they're done. Serial right, killers. But being, being in jail, wouldn't that make you feel better, though? Like, if they're in jail for life? Why do they have to be dead? I, well, yes. And I've done ones. Like, Ed Kemper, we did him. He was right, my first yeah. serial killer I ever did. He's alive. Yeah. He's in prison. I obviously felt okay about that. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> I mean, not okay, but you know, but I just, it just makes me more comfortable. Okay. okay. All right. He's not going to make a phone call from jail and be like, put a hit on, on this lady. No. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, now I put that in your head. Okay. It's time to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, thanks again for bringing that to us. We hope you enjoyed it. Let us know what you think about this guy. If you've heard of him before, because I feel like he isn't that well known. I just randomly came across like we scroll through people magazine um, shows every now and then we're just like that one looks interesting and I don't watch like all of them so it's random that we came across that one so oh also and I should mention there is an entire podcast on him oh a whole one it's called the clearing and it is only available on Spotify and it's very well done and April the daughter participates in the podcast so you know now that you're saying that there is a possibility that I actually, yep, yeah, I listened to it. Yeah, yep, to my <laughs> Spotify list. <laughs> We're doing great. Yep. Okay, well, there yep. you go. That's a good one. Pineapple Street Studios. <laughs> yes, that's it. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Oh, it says updated April 11th, 2022. I need to go back and, oh, they're doing a different season. Yes. Oh, no. I think it was a, a preview for another podcast that they're doing. I don't oh, okay. think it was okay. on Ed, anyway. Wayne Edwards. But anyway, okay. it's very well done. So if you want to go down that rabbit hole, I think it's like nine or 10 episodes worth of stuff. It's very good. Um, I appreciate hearing things from the daughter's perspective. It just gives a little bit more authentication and weight. Um, mm-hmm. So anyway. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks for that. Um, like I said, let us know what you think about it and we hope you enjoy the rest of the serial killer September series. And if you want some survivor stories, go check us out on Patreon because we've got two sept- survivor September stories that will be going up on there. So go check that out. $3 a month. You can get a lot of fun content with that. And just always remember, the world is scary, people suck, especially serial killers, hide in your closets.